Well, anyway, thanks so much for having me. I'm Jenny Splitter, independent journalist, um, and I'm I'm really excited to have this conversation. And I'm going to introduce the panelists real quick. So we have Kate Kruger, who is the managing partner for Helicon Consulting. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that right. Um, Bruce Friedrich, who's the founder and CEO of the Good Food Institute. Bjorn Trag, who is chief scientific officer at Andes Ag, and Guillaume Barbier who's the program director of the nitrogen fixation program at Join Bio. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A as we go. We're gonna start off with sort of a, a quick presentation from each speaker and then uh, move on to conversation. So, oh, there I am. <laughs> okay, so let's start out. Well, actually, look, Bjorn, since I can see you, do you mind if we start with you? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, happy, happy to be here and with my fe fellow panelists. And uh, to to start off, I think the idea is to uh, to introduce myself and, and talk a little bit about what Andy's does, uh, and then specifically in the context of of using genetic engineering. Um, so, so at Andy's, we're we're focused on 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 the climate crisis that we're all faced with, and I don't think I have to explain to anyone on the call that we're uh, experiencing. Uh, 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 unprecedented events due to climate change, uh, and there's a real sense of urgency to act now. Um, and this is going to require different technologies and different approaches. And, and at Andes, we focus on, on biology in this, in this fight against climate change. Um, there is a, a demand for, for scalable and uh, affordable technologies uh, in this. And, and our initial focus is on agriculture because of, because of that scalability, because of the access to millions of uh, acres of uh, agricultural land. In terms of that affordability, what we do is we focus on, on microbes and, and enzymes and, and rely on, on the natural functions that these, um, that these microbes have. And we've developed a, a, a technology to deliver these microbes directly with the seed um, to, to, in, in order to, to bring these to, uh, to, uh, to a, a farmer's field. Um, why I believe, very strongly believe that uh, engineering is, re is required in this is that uh, even though we, we rely on these natural functions of, of microbes and, and enzymes, uh, in order to have these work at the scale that is required, um, we need to dial up, we need to dial up what nature is providing us. Um, in many cases, um, uh, these, are, these are functions that the microbe would do normally, um, but not necessarily, of course, for the purpose that we, that we require. Um, and, and, and similar to, to one of our other panelists, we, we have one program that is focused on using microbes to replace synthetic fertilizer, uh, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, um, of course, an incredibly important uh, asset in agriculture, um, but the process and the application of synthetic fertilizer also brings together, uh, brings with it a lot of pollution and, and carbon emission. Uh, and we focus on using microbes to, to deliver that nitrogen to the plant um, through our seed treatment technology uh, and thereby reducing the carbon emissions that are associated to that. We have a second program that is directly aimed at carbon removal, again, using microbes, uh, engineered microbes then to, uh, to remove that carbon from the atmosphere uh, in, in using that direct association of, of plants and, and, and microbes. Um, so to, to sum it up, uh, I'm, I've, I've been working in the space for, for, for quite a while. Uh, I've also uh, uh, have developed microbes for agriculture uh, using uh, conventional tools or non-engineering tools. Uh, I'm a big uh, fan of microbiology and bacteria, um, but I also do believe, again, that, that engineering is, uh, is an important tool that we have uh, to bring these products to, to work at the scale that's required to, to make the impact that we need uh, and that we need very soon. Great, thank you so much. And before I move on, is there one thing you can pull out that you're most excited about for the next year, either in your own work or for sort of the field more broadly? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll say uh, maybe there are two things. Uh, uh, again, because uh, because of our focus on on climate change, I'm I'm generally really excited about all of the um, new technology and new approaches that I'm seeing. Uh, not all necessarily yet uh, to you know uh, uh, to be delivered at scale, but there there's a lot of uh, movement in 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 this space. More specifically around uh, agriculture and engineered microbes. Um, uh, I'm actually uh, very excited that um, we are not the only company that's focused on, on engineering microbes that see the benefit of engineering. And obviously, Guy will say some more about that. Um, 
I, I think there's a lot of positive movements in um, using engineering tools to, to make, make, make a beneficial change for, for agriculture and for agricultural input. So I'm really excited about that. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much. It's fascinating. I'm going to try to bounce back and forth between the sort of food space and ag space folks. I see Bruce Friedrich's name right next, so I'm, I'm going that way if that's okay. Um, so I'll turn it over to you. Uh, great, thanks very much, Jenny. Um, and uh, mega kudos to Anastasia uh, and Melinda and Kelly uh, and everybody else who worked on putting these two days together. It's, it's very, very exciting. Um, and uh, considering all the, all the uh, PhDs, I felt a little uh, fish out of water, uh, but I was asked to level set uh, a little bit about the importance and the impact um, of the work uh, that all the scientists are doing in this space. Um, and I am delighted to do that. Um, so the way that we look at it at the Good Food Institute, um, meat production, according to the UN, is going to go up by 50 to 100 uh, percent by 2050. Um, even in the United States, where the external costs of meat production are best known, uh, per capita meat consumption was the highest it has been in recorded history in 2020. Uh, the number two year was 2019. Um, so for 50 years, uh, environmentalists and animal protection advocates and others have been begging the world to eat less meat. Um, and the only trajectory that anybody thinks is likely, especially because of developing economies, um, is at least 50% more meat production by 2050. Um, already right now, meat production produces more than 10 gigatons of direct emissions, CO2 equivalent, um, and is more than a fifth of the global total. Um, and I'm not gonna dive into that other than to say that is just direct emissions. It also uses three quarters um, of the land that is used for agriculture. So we farm globally about 4 billion hectares of land, 3 billion hectares of that, um, either grows feed crops uh, for chickens and pigs um, or grazes ruminants. Um, and quite simply, we're not gonna tell people to eat less meat. Um, in the same way, we're not gonna tell people to drive less so we make electric cars. Um, and we're not gonna tell people, if, especially in developing economies, that they need to uh, consume less energy. We need to shift to renewable energy. Um, in the same way, we need to solve this problem by creating alternatives to conventional meat production that are not designed for people who are willing to sacrifice on taste or pay more. Uh, the world of the veggie burger is the world of, you know, we have a very limited, it's robust, but it's a limited market um, and it's a non-market in developing economies where people can, can start to eat meat. So uh, the super exciting thing about precision fermentation um, is that it relies on having the functionality and the flavor. It allows us to get to that that's identical or superior to animal products. Um, we have access to the most exquisitely functional animal proteins via precision fermentation. Um, and you look at something like the Impossible Burger, and that is possible uh, because of synthetic biology that produces the heme. Um, Motif is now doing bovine heme, which is very exciting. There are companies doing um, dairy, companies like Perfect Day and Nobel. There are companies doing um, eggs. Um, and it really does seem to be the essential thing. You know, we've had 12,000 years of animal domestication for food and to figure out how to do something uh, that biomimics the precise taste, texture, et cetera, um, it certainly feels like precision fermentation is absolutely necessary. And what that means is that precision fermentation, if that's true, uh, then it's necessary to meeting Paris goals because the scientific consensus is in. Uh, we don't keep climate change under 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, relative to pre-industrial levels unless conventional meat consumption goes down. Um, and literally nobody has a plausible theory for how that happens. Um, other than we give consumers the exact same products, the products that they are bio that are indistinguishable to them um, for a lower price. Um, and this allows us to do that. Um, that is obviously a, a super um, tight synopsis. Uh, happy, you know, GFI, the plurality of GFI's team members are scientists. Um, so we are a, a science focused organization. Um, we have scientists, we have their GFI is a consortium of organizations. So there's GFI US, but there's also uh, GFIs in India, Israel, Brazil, uh, Singapore, and Europe. 
Um, so folks who want to get in, involved in uh, the scientific endeavors that we're working on should certainly go to gfi.org and you can click on global and find your uh, GFI affiliate. But our, our big goal is very, very excited by what Sally said at the outset. Um, our big goal is to help with a clear, safe, robust, but also, um, also science-based uh, regulatory frameworks around the world. Um, and then also convincing governments that for the same reason they fund um, endeavors focused on renewable energy and electrification of transport, they should be funding the science um, on this and, and governments are, are uh, listening, which is, uh, which is really pretty exciting. So um, I will stop there other than to say, um, definitely, if you're interested, get involved. We have a ton of reports coming out uh, momentarily. So um, sign up our, for our newsletters to find out when those come out uh, at gfi.org slash newsletters. Great. Thank you so much, Bruce. And then tell us one thing that you are most excited about for, for next year in the space. Uh, fats. Um, so the, the first companies that were focused on basically the theory of change that I just laid out um, were formed in 2015. Um, Perfect Day, Clara Foods, and then, uh, or maybe 2014 or 2015. Um, in 2020, there were two companies thinking about precision fermentation uh, to replicate the fat experience in plant-based meat, meat. So basically the proteins and the fats are ingredients and products that are otherwise plant-based meat that get, get them to something that's indistinguishable from the perspective of beet eaters. Um, but fats are gonna be a hurdle. Um, they're just, you know, there isn't, a, <laughs> there isn't enough coconut oil um, or probably capacity for coconut oil. So um, the fact that there, that four new companies launched in 2021 uh, focused on using synthetic biology to bioreplicate uh, the fat experience for ingredients and plant-based meat. Um, and we think we're going to see a lot more about more of that. Very, very exciting. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Guy. Yeah. Hi. Hi, thanks for having me on this panel. So I'm Guy Barbier. I'm the program director of the biosustainability platform at Join Bio. And our most uh, publicly um, uh, project, the, the project we publicly disclose currently is a nitrogen fixation project. So in that particular project, we are trying to replace some of the chemical fertilizer by using microbe. But uh, what is Joint Bio? So at Joint Bio, we engineer microbe for sustainable agriculture. So our Primary, uh, primary target is really to use synthetic biology to engineer microbe in order to provide farmers with solutions which are unmet today. Uh, a little bit about Joint Bio. Joint Bio is a joint venture which was put together between Bayer, so obviously a big player in the ag field, and Gingo Biowork, which is uh, a player in the synthetic biology. So I think the, the parent company really shows what we are doing. It's really take the cutting edge synthetic biology and use that as a tool to, to, to meet the needs of the farmers. So I'm, uh, we, are, we are engineering microbes. So we are not using wild type. Our technologies revolve around selecting some microbes which is naturally present in the soil and from there, engineer them to um, um, improve their performances. So you target an engineering entry point and you go after it until you see performance in plants are going up based on that. So that's really what we are doing at Joint Bio. It's using heavy synthetic biology in order to engineer the microbe to reach the unmet needs. So why are we doing that? I think. Uh, Bjorn and Bruce described the issues, obviously. Uh, and the key, what we found is that with regular biologics, um, there was no like real big uh, key product which came out of the biologics market. You have some products, some serenade from Bayer and things like that, which are there, which are wild type. But the observation is that there's no real good products of wild type uh, microbes. And if there was one, it would be known and would have been obviously would have been a success. And we have not seen it. We've seen a lot of producer, a lot of fragmented market, a lot of people are making claims, but when you get to the farmer, nobody is really convinced by it because they did their own test. And at the end, well, it's not a practice they adopted. So knowing that we looked at it and we were, okay, well, these microbes are doing something in the soil, they co-evolved with the plant for billion years. Therefore, there is some 
benefits and it's some kind of symbiosis between the plant and the microbe, whatever we want to call it. So let's use that and let's find some microbes which are naturally present in the soil and interact with the plant. And let's go ahead and use a synthetic biology really to unleash its power so we can tap into that. So that's really kind of what Joint Bio is doing. In particular, I'm in charge of the nitrogen fixation project. So what we are doing, it's engineer microbes to be able to interact with the plants. The plants give the carbon and energy source to power the bacterial nitrogen fixation. It's really prevalent in the soil. Every plant has some type of bacteria doing that. So really our uh, target here is to select the best microbe which do that naturally and then improve it using engineering. And Great. With that, yep. oh, sorry. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And, and so can you tell me your, your one thing that you're most excited about? Is it similar to Bjorn or, or, or something exciting? Well, I, I try to find something to be different. Uh, but yes, obviously, there's a lot of things, common, common themes with Bjorn and Bruce. But I think one thing I'm, I'm excited to it to see the government agencies actually and this type of workshop starting to try to catch up with the technology in order to adapt the laws and regulation. And I think there's a lot of traction in the biotech field, obviously with COVID and the agriculture because the Paris protocol called out agriculture as being a way to do it. So now we have the focus and we are also getting uh, the resources to do it and now seeing the government agencies looking into it and trying to find ways to facilitate innovations and yet still make sure we protect the environment correctly from releasing genetically modified microbes in the field. I think that's something which got me excited to get people's attention, to get the government agencies' attention, because I think if we can lower the barrier to that type of innovation and have more competitors in this field, that's what eventually is going to drive the innovation and get to a point where we have actual real product which will work and for real and over and over year after year and eventually have an impact on the environment in the long term. Great, thank you so much. Okay, and last but certainly not least, we have Kate Kruger um, from Helicon, take it away. Wonderful, great. Well, thank you so much, Jamie and um, Anastasia for the invitation to speak on this panel today. I'm very, very excited to share a little bit of what I'd call a little bit more of a high level view of the entire space, especially in the food area. So um, my name again is Dr. Kate Kruger. I'm managing partner of Helicon Consulting. And we're a technical advisory firm that focuses on working with investors to maximize biotech opportunities uh, across the frontier biotech space, uh, largely in food, working on things like molecular farming, cell-based meat, Precision fermentation, so good to hear that from you, Bruce, earlier to talk about precision fermentation and so many opportunities out there in addition to cell-based meat. Um, so many of these technologies that uh, my firm works on um, and advises on involve genetic engineering, either in the product or in the process. I know that kind of um, was highlighted earlier. Those are two ways that food products can uh, involve genetic engineering. And we see both. We see both things like plants, for instance, or bacteria or yeast being used to produce a number of food uh, foods, but also the cells themselves being used to produce food. So if you're looking at something like cell-based meat, what you're looking for there is a technology in which uh, the cells themselves may be genetically modified and then eaten directly as a product. So I think we got a lot of really exciting kind of shout outs from different parts in the discipline areas that we're working on today. So Bjorn's comment about dialing up the organism doing so much for us, that really resonates because not only is it really, really important that we do work that supports um, more of a, an animal friendly, planet friendly tech, but also something that forwards climate friendly tech. So really pushing the technologies that we can use to use our land better, more efficiently, uh, to process those goals as much as we can. So that can look like a lot of different things. We can look at growing proteins in plants through something called molecular farming. We can look at things like using laboratory facilities to make various proteins, either precision fermentation, 
um, algal growth, all sorts of options with potential meat applications. And so these are the sorts of technologies that my team often uh, works with. So we're a team of synthetic biologists, bioengineers, tissue engineers, chemical engineers, uh, cell biologists, microbiologists who focus on these different areas, because that's one of the really exciting things about this field is not only is it completely cutting edge, it also is very cross-disciplinary. So when you start thinking about these disciplines, you see a lot of overlap from one to the other. Um, and so for instance, if you're looking at a process that involves precision fermentation, you're going to need bioprocess experts, you're going to need um, food experts as well. So seeing that melding of disciplines together is really, really exciting. And I think we start to see a whole lot about that in this area. And genetic engineering, a large component of this technology is going to require that to really push those potentials that we have. And so um, here at Helicon, we look a lot at what those opportunities for growth are, both with applying traditional academic disciplines and other applied technologies to these new disciplines. There's so much room for growth. That's one of the things that I think all of us are certainly motivated by, definitely myself. I think it's absolutely thrilling that we can think about not only just what we can do today, but what we can do tomorrow with, in many cases, existing or largely existing technologies, uh, applying these technologies to the areas we're applying them to today, whether it's food or some of this carbon fixation work, in many cases hasn't been going on that long. While well, some may have been around for a while, a lot of these food applications we would have never thought of 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and so that pushing the boundaries with, in many cases, largely existing technology is just such an exciting place where, you know, there's just so much potential on a really quick and short time scale. Um, and so really what we do also at Helicon is work on these questions of like, what would it take? So here we are today, what does it take to get to tomorrow um, on a technical granular nuts and bolts level? Uh, so that, that kind of question is I think something that we all need to think about more and more because not only are we in a place where we're looking at really exciting technology today, we're also looking at tomorrow. Uh, and tomorrow is very close and really very exciting in this area. So I guess I just wanna end on a high note. Uh, Helicon Consulting is absolutely thrilled to be able to work across these disciplines and um, explore the potential. So <laughs> whether, it's, whether it's some of these food products or beauty products or ways to be more climate friendly, there are just a lot of options out there. So um, onwards and upwards, essentially. I know we're almost at the end of this panel, so I'm going to hand it back over to Jenny uh, <laughs> to go from here. I was going to ask you also like what, what your one most exciting thing is, but I feel like your whole- Oh, your whole okay. Yeah, I'm very like, excited about everything. <laughs> in the short yeah, term, though. <laughs> If we want to zoom in and be granular, I'm really excited about some of the labeling conversations that are coming up uh, that were raised in the past fall and winter. Uh, I think those labeling conversations around cell-based meat in particular have a lot of potential to be really transformative to that industry. Um, and, and they could look like a lot of things. So I'm really excited to watch that space and see where that goes. I am looking forward to that too. Um, and so someone asked, Claire Thorpe asked a question that leads perfectly to my next, my next question, which was to talk about the challenges. And so maybe to kind of frame it this way in terms of, you know, what, what are some of the challenges, especially with, with the regulatory hurdles um, and, and bringing these products to market? Um, this might be uh, dangerous, but I'm saying anyone want to just pop in <laughs> and answer? Don't all talk at once, but someone talk? Or should I call on you? I mean, I, I would say that for, for microbes in agriculture, in the US at least, there, there's a, a, a reasonably clear framework or at least um, guidance as to, as to how to, uh, um, who to approach and, and how to get these uh, the strains or products registered. Um, there are um, some relatively, you know, there's some guidelines as to what is considered, um, uh, you know, a GMO label versus a non-GMO label. That um, it doesn't necessarily always follow. Uh, I would say, kind of the the logic when it when it comes to. Um, I, I think a lot of the spaces or a lot of this is based on on plant regulations and when it comes to microbes who in the environment freely exchange DNA pretty rapidly. Um, some of the 
I, I think barriers are sort of arbitrary in that sense. Um, but uh, to, you know, to say it positively, uh, I think uh, I think in the U.S. for sure, um, you know, the the EPA is is uh, is typically a willing um, uh, partner and 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 would you know wants you to engage with them. Um, going outside of the U.S., it certainly gets more challenging. I'll, I'll stay away from Europe uh, for now. Um, there are similar opportunities probably in South America, uh, where where some countries are are shaping up with some more clear regulations. Um, but but I would say that right now the U.S. is is the front runner when it comes to kind of having having some sense of of where to go. I'll also just say uh, GFI has a, a is putting out a deep dive um, into precision and and uh, whole biomass fermentation alongside our our other deep dives in early March, um, and it answers the precision fermentation regulatory question um, with geographic focus. It'll be out in in early March, I believe. Uh, but yeah, it's absolutely, uh, the, the U.S. is particularly good, although Singapore and, and Israel are looking pretty promising as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we have regulatory attorneys working on this precise question all over the world and some distilled analysis of that um, coming out early next month. Um, unfortunately, okay. we'll Sorry, have to move on. I just saw your chat, Anastasia. Apologies on that. I'm like, oh, uh, one minute, seven minutes ago. Sorry about that. But maybe folks can answer the Q&As. Um, go in and type an answer, just get those, because there's some good ones in there. 